Welcome back to the Modern Star Wars Toy Line on Spectre Creative. And today we're talking about regular things versus, well, I guess, uh, deluxe things or super deluxe things. Now, while you can find this in everything from cars to baked goods, why are we talking about this today? Well, because it's not uncommon to have deluxe labeled as a segment in toys. You've probably seen this on a lot of toys, from kids' toys to high-end collector toys. Deluxe versions of figures are as much a part of toys as articulation is. So, as a quick background on this, one of them, well, I didn't work on the Star Wars movies, except for the Big Figs line at Jack's, I did work very intimately on the Green Lantern movie line, and in this line, we had both your basic figures, which was a figure that came with a ring and a snap-on accessory, and of course there were lots of different variants of the main character in the basic figure line, and we had a deluxe line, which was essentially the same scale figure, the same articulation, but in this case the accessory that he or she, did we have any she's? I don't know if we had any female figures in the line, I think it was all male, but either way, the accessory was something that would, for Green Lantern, pop out and become kind of a giant accessory, mimicking one of his constructs. We had, uh, I think, about five or six figures in the deluxe line versus roughly 20 figures in the basic line. And same thing, whether it was Hal Jordan or Kilowog, one of his alien buddies, you would get a deluxe accessory that, in this case, had a pop-out feature. Deluxe figures are usually feature-based, whether it's projectiles or some kind of, as it says, instant transformation. Something that really communicates to the buyer that this is not just a basic figure, but you're getting something bigger and badder and, well, more deluxe. All right, so why am I going through all these Green Lantern toys on a Star Wars video? Well, because I want to set up what the premise of deluxe figures are, and it's because they're designed to fit into a planogram, as all toys are. When you go to retail and you look at any aisle, whether it's candles, baby goods, or toys, there's both incremental space, things like this Monopoly pop-up that could be put in aisle or, you know, anywhere in the store, but if you're actually in the toy aisle, everything is organized on what's called a planogram. Everything has a place, everything is scientifically designed, given specific measurements to fit. And this is not something new, this is something that was done back in the day, too. Toys were designed so that they would be easily merched and easily retailed to potential buyers. It all starts off with something like this, where it's very blank. You just know the amount of square footage you're going to have. And this could range from two feet to a giant section, like just shown for Star Wars. The most common purchase of any toy at Big Bass Retail is the birthday present. And I'm not talking about the birthday present for your child. I'm talking about the birthday present for your child's friend, because you're going to go to the toy aisle probably 15 to 30 times during the year to pick out a toy for your child's friend's birthday. So while the new modern Star Wars line that was kicked off by Kenner slash Hasbro in 1995 started off with basic figures, adding more skews is what allowed it to have a planogram and a permanent home on shelf. Your basic skew, your basic figure, which is going to have the greatest number of SKUs, meaning you know, you're going to do anywhere from 25 to 100 individual basic figures, you need other things to fill out a planogram because you have to think what's going to hang next to it, what's going to hang on the middle shelf, and what's going to hang on the bottom shelf or be placed on the bottom shelf. So that's why you see things like basic vehicles, and these things are shipped in assortments not just a one-off item. You're going to see multiple items in the same packaging structure at the same price point, and it's all done for the planogram. Likewise, you have what are called mid-price vehicles as opposed to entrance price point. And again, you'll see refreshes of different vehicles, but they're all at the same price point, and they all fit into the same box, the same dimensions. And then finally, it's common to have what's called a driver or TV driver on the bottom shelf that's the biggest vehicle or playset, and this is usually refreshed annually with something new, so that way there's a big item for the holidays that takes up the bottom space. So deluxe figures are basically part of the planogram because they can hang next to your basic figure and can offer consumers sort of an up purchase, especially at that birthday gift price point, 
parents usually want to spend somewhere between $15 and $20 on a birthday gift for their child's friend, and that's really the point of the deluxe figure. The basic figure is more of an impulse buy or a gift for your own child, maybe for a good report card or just to say I love you. The deluxe figure is really designed to be giftable. It's designed at a price point that will be perfect to quickly identify and say, oh, that's perfect for you know little Johnny or little, little Sally's friend at their birthday party this weekend. So the first deluxe figures that came out for the Power of the Force 2 line were these orange-carded Stormtrooper Luke and Han figures that included sort of slightly off-camera, kind of like the mini-rigs of old devices. Han with his uh, smuggler backpack uh, with a slightly retooled chest with orange straps stuck on that were non-removable and part of the sculpt. And same thing, the Stormtrooper had, I believe it was called the Riot Gear, or Stormtrooper Riot Control, where he got this giant backpack with jet engines and claws, and Luke got a really cool kind of Tatooine skiff. Now, these really weren't for me in the sense that I only collect original trilogy figures, not kind of these, you know, expanded universe, slightly off-camera things. For the second wave of deluxe figures, however, when they were on the green card, well, here we were getting both a mix of on-camera, slightly off-camera, or creative license figures, as well as characters that were going to be sort of a, a, well, army builders, but uh, modified versions of, of you know, troops we had, and deluxe skews that weren't even figures, but were just sort of, well, I guess, robots that were bigger than a regular figure and needed this kind of package in order to deliver. So the first one in this series was the Boba Fett with giant, huge missile-firing backpack. So he never wore this in the movies. He kind of, I mean, he had a jetpack, and this is kind of meant to be a jetpack that was, well, I guess more than a jetpack. I guess you could say you could picture Boba Fett's jetpack as a basic pack, and this was a jetpack that was more or less... Now picture that, but everywhere. So yeah, not really for me. Uh, you know, I get why they made this. Boba Fett's very popular, but I follow my own rules when it comes to Star Wars collecting. Well, really, I make my own rules, and that's original trilogy figures. Because if you're going to be a completist, you've got to set your rules on what you're completing. And for me, it's all about the original trilogy. I do have some prequel figures and some other things, but I'm hardcore when it comes to original trilogy. And the two figures that spoke to me the most was the Snow Trooper and the Hoth Trooper. So let's go through those. The Hoth Trooper, the deluxe version, came with the laser radar disc. Dish? Radar dish. Yes, I can say words these days. This was a slightly modified version of the single-carded figure. He got a new head and even a slightly re-sculpted uh, chest piece because the goggles were now over his eyes as opposed to hanging below his neck. And he came with a giant oversized accessory that blasted... Uh, uh, well, I guess they tried to use it at the AT-ATs, and they took them out with a, a what do you call them again? A laser. And there were quite a few different lasers for Hoth. I mean, there was the laser tower, there was the laser boob shooter thing. Okay, it's an ion cannon, I know. And then there's the laser radar disc. So, dish. Did I say disc again? This is the same radar dish that was seen on the vintage Hoth Trooper card back, and obviously, you know, there's several shots of it in the film. It's, you know, kind of one of those blink and you miss it. But they do get a couple good blasts off of it. I think it hits one of the AT-ATs, or excuse me, AT-ATs, in the leg and has no effect on it. But, uh, you know, hey, it was a cool way to try to defend a bunch of ice and a bunch of caverns from the Imperials. And to say that a figure with a giant laser cannon is a good idea for a toy is an understatement. This is perfect, especially for a boy's toy. You get a kid and a giant laser gun. I mean, it's awesome. It's such an easy, easy sell-in. And for us collectors, now that we already had our single-carded Hoth Trooper, well, now we could have him be joined by another slightly different version and start army building. The Radar Laser Dish was originally released in the vintage line without any figures. So, again, it was a deluxe accessory or a deluxe skew to build out planograms, but it came figureless. It was just the radar dish. Later, Hasbro was going to release a 
Defensive Hoth collection, two different packs at Target, the good guy version was going to come with an updated version of the laser dish that was now bigger and had a big red missile in it. So, you know, you could kind of slightly, constantly upgrade your laser dish from the vintage all the way to modern. And Cobra from G.I. Joe would eventually reuse the tool because, you know, Hasbro tooling reasons. So, hey, you could get a blue one, too, I guess, with a Cobra insignia. The next one was the Snow Trooper. So unlike the Hoth Trooper in the deluxe set, the Snow Trooper was the very first Power of the Force 2 Snow Trooper we ever got. Eventually, we would get a single carded version in a couple waves down the line that would reuse some of the parts, notably the chest and the uh, arms there. But this was still a little while off, and so the Snow Trooper that was going to come with the, again, giant gun, same philosophy as the Hoth Trooper with giant radar dish gun, was your first Snow Trooper, and he was a little dirtier than the uh, one that came single-carded, so you got some variant. You got some, uh, you know, he's kind of covered with some Hoth, uh, Hoth dust, Hoth mud. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know how you get dirty on a snow planet. And again, like the radar laser cannon, the tripod laser cannon, or E-Web Blaster, as it was finally name-checked on the Mandalorian series, was available in an assortment of accessories. You know, they never made that one on the bottom right there, the vehicle maintenance uh, charger, which you do see in Hoth. Interesting that uh, it's one of the few vintage items that we've never gotten remade. And, of course, the vintage E-Web cannon, or the Snow Trooper laser cannon, was virtually the same as the new one. It had three legs, a tripod that snapped in place, and the charger base with the tube that went to it, because that's how it was able to be so powerful. It had its own portable battery power pack, and came in a box. Now, we would get more versions of the E-Web Cannon, notably one that actually came with a Snow Trooper. So basically, almost exactly the same as a deluxe figure, but this was a basic figure. The only difference was it didn't come with the battery pack and the tube that went into the bottom. But you were basically getting the same item. I mean, it was a different tool, but it was, you know, a cannon and a snow trooper. So, and that one came with a handheld blaster. In that, to uh, excuse me, Target Hoth battle pack, the good guy one that we showed a few moments ago, there was also a corresponding Imperial version that came with an ATST or AT-ST, and it also came with the snow trooper and E-Web cannon, albeit without the tube and battery. So, Snowtroopers would continue to populate the line, and we would get a mix of dirty versions, clean versions, smudged versions, battle-damaged versions, some with more articulation, some with less articulation, some with removable helmets, some that were just, you know, in waiting for the bus pose. But the Snowtrooper was much like the Stormtrooper, an evergreen figure. This first one, because he was posed in kind of a blasting position, is always permanently in that kind of like a well, I gotta go, I gotta run, uh, I gotta crouch position with non-articulated legs there. But for being posed with the cannon, he works perfectly. So, it's great. Finally, the last deluxe figure in this assortment was the probe droid, or probot. So this one was interesting because it had an action feature that went beyond just a launching missile. It actually had a blast-apart head, or top part where much like in the movie where Han blasts the probot and it turns out to have a self-destruct switch or mechanism, well, you can kind of recreate that at home because blowing up robots is fun, kids. Now, while it was really cool that it had the exploding head feature, this also meant that it had to have these bright orange pieces hanging out of it, both for the projectile, which launched out of the head, and for the mechanism that held the head onto the body, for the exploding feature. So it really had two features, the missile and the, uh, the head blowing off. So while the version in the movie, the puppet that was used, did have lights that shined sort of a yellowish, not really orange, more of a white, if you were really going to say any color, it didn't have that bright orange tip that the toy had. And this is probably done for safety reasons, but it definitely threw off the look. It is interesting to note that the reason this Probot looks different from a lot of other things in Star Wars is that the influence from it, or at least the original direction, was something taken from the artwork of Morbius, who is a sci-fi artist who was renowned for his work in the 60s and 70s, 
And in one of his comic books, well, he has a very specific look for his comics. They have kind of a very sort of organic feel to sci-fi, and that's why the Probot looks more organic looking than a lot of other Star Wars ships. And if you look closely at this panel here, notoriously, the uh, the Probot is right there, if you, know, if you need a uh, black and white version to show you what we're looking at. So yeah, this is kind of where he came from, and uh, he somehow wound up in Empire Strikes Back. Much like the other two cannons, the Probot was available in the Vintage line as part of a turret and Probot playset, combining two different Hoth elements in one to basically expand your hot play. While the Probot never met the turret gun in the movie, well, you know, at least they could play together. And I will note, as cool as the modern Power of the Force 2 Probot is, the vintage one is kind of better in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, it doesn't have that giant orange eye missile thing that makes it, you know, non-movie accurate. And the fact that the vintage one is better than the modern one... Which I admit is both bogus and sad. Yeah, it kind of made me wish I had the vintage one uh, from the old days. I never did. One of my friends had it as a kid, and I remember being amazed by it, not even believing it was a Star Wars toy, because it didn't really look very Star Wars, but it obviously is. And there have been some other Probots made, notably the 6-inch Black Series one. is pretty amazing, although obviously out of scale for 3 and 3 fourth. This Probot was re-released in a battle assault on Hoth, though without the giant orange missile eye thingy. And then the best modern one we've gotten was part of the Force Link collection for uh, one of the last uh, Disney movie, well, for the middle Disney movie. And, uh, you know, it was really awesome, although very hard to get because it was packed one per case with a whole bunch of uh, monster figures from uh, Episode 7 that nobody really wanted. And this one wound up being a figure that became quite difficult to track down. It's not perfect. It could definitely stand for a lot more articulation, especially in the legs. But, you know, this Last Jedi version, or at least the one that shipped with Last Jedi, is still the best modern one we've gotten, I think. Uh, the way out classing the Power of the Force 2 one, but maybe not even as good as the vintage. So that was the uh, deluxe line. It would continue with other different arrangements of multi-packs and higher-priced figures to hit that birthday price point, and we continue to enjoy Star Wars figures.